as you saw on the, on the agenda, the, the symposium is broken down in two sessions. Uh, the second one, is, quite honestly, when I saw the PowerPoint slides coming from Dr. Bell, I thought it was fascinating. You know, the idea of a case study of, of finding uh, uh, Bin Laden. Uh, uh, on that, um, that's actually the one that I was no offense in your first session, but this is the one I was waiting for. <laughs> uh, that, that, that was fascinating. You know, look at those 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 type of things. I imagine there's going to be tons of questions on on, on those uh, uh, on that aspect. Uh, we have time. We're doing really uh, a long time by all these uh, that stuff from the uh, go. I will tell you one of the things I neglected this the the, the mention beforehand. Is that I know you have a card copies of all those. You write some notes. Oftentimes, you have people come back. But can we actually get the PowerPoints? All of you. Um, if you're registered online um, uh, uh, through our website, if you go to the same spot where all the symposiums, the all the PowerPoints, the agendas, even the video, uh, the video will be edited. And, uh, usually, it takes about two to two and a half weeks to edit it, broken out. It's on there as well. And so you can actually go back and say, see this, it doesn't make sense, I want to go back to, to the video, what is he said on that, it'll be available. And the idea is not only a symposium on this thing, but potentially a gift that keeps on giving um, in terms of going back and say, what did he actually say, let me put this together. So PowerPoints will be uh, uh, online as, as, as well. So with that, I uh, like to Dr. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Chief, and thank you again, everybody. I am glad that uh, we saved this talk, maybe the best uh, for last, otherwise maybe more people would have uh, left at, at the break. Um, I do want to mention uh, about communications also. As you may have seen, I've got my email address on the last slide of both these presentations. I think we've got packets with them. that. Welcome that anybody has more questions or, or ideas, uh, uh, comments later on, just uh, send me a note, whatever you like. But for, for the next hour, what I'd like to talk to you about is a project that uh, I certainly found fascinating. I, in fact, started on this project when I was teaching a Homeland Security class with at, at the Naval Postgraduate School through the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. And in that class of about 32 students were many of the agencies represented here today, including state and local law enforcement from around the country, uh, federal uh, law enforcement, uh, DHS, a number of different agencies. Uh, and we were teaching when that the famous raid on Abbottabad took place and when Bin Laden was killed. And of course, we were talking about that in class. Uh, and the question came up, well, can we, can we really know the inside story about it? And here I'm not talking about the inside story about the SEAL team and, and sort of the, the daring do of, of the SEALs. That's not my business. I was in the Navy, but not in the SEALs. But we were talking in class about the intelligence aspect of this. How, how did we find him? And how could it take, why did it take 10 years after 9-11? for the most uh, expensive, probably the most capable intelligence system on the face of the Earth, maybe in the history of our planet, it took 10 years for us to find a six foot five inch bad guy that the whole world was looking for. So we were talking about that in class. And then started thinking and some folks commented that, well, we're probably never gonna really know because it's all really super secret hush hush. And I sort of took that as a challenge to try to see at the open source, unclassified level, what do we know about the search for bin Laden? What seemed to work, what seemed to not work, and what, what are the lessons learned for keeping America and our allies for intelligence, counterterrorism today? So that's the project I, I worked on. Uh, and again, when everything is unclassified. Uh, this information has all been uh, vetted for security purposes. Nothing, uh, the intelligence community is not gonna vouch for my findings that are my own academic findings. Uh, but uh, but it's, there's nothing in here that uh, uh, that the intelligence community is concerned about. Uh, got it all from open source. And I should also mention that, that of course, everything I talk about today is my own personal view. I'm not here speaking for the Navy, the Naval Postgraduate School, or the U.S. government. But what I tried to look at is uh, what's the story behind what you could call the greatest, one of the greatest intelligence successes of our lifetime. And in fact, I found that there's a bigger story in the search for the model, a bigger story that I think talks to the history and the future of American intelligence today, not just on the domestic side. So now we're sort of opening our, our aperture a bit more from our earlier session, looking at, at international counterterrorism, international intelligence. Uh, maybe we'll finish up with a few thoughts on, on what this might mean for tomorrow. I did uh, put this argument down on paper in an academic article in a journal called 
uh, Political Science Quarterly. Be glad to share that article uh, with you if, if you'd like. If you don't, you may have access to uh, to the library through the UTAP. Uh, um, but uh, feel free to send me a, a note uh, later on. Be able to be glad to share that article with you. What I really tried to look at, and one way to sort of focus on the dilemma, the question I was trying to focus on, and often you want to have a question or a puzzle in any sort of a project, was how did we get here? You may recognize this picture, this famous picture that was uh, in the press about the, the White House Situation Room during the raid on the Vatabad. As you may know, this actually isn't the Situation Room itself. This is a smaller conference room just off the Situation Room in the White House. But what I really wondered was, how did we get to the point where, where so many of our top leaders could be here focusing on, on what our U.S. military intelligence community was doing? It, it's also interesting, I don't have time right now, so I'm not going to have to do a pop quiz. We said earlier in the morning there's no quiz. But when I, when I talk about this in my classes at the Naval Postgraduate School, I'll sometimes pose a question, uh, who knows who all these people in this picture are? And even a few years ago, these are all from the Obama administration, so most of these folks are not in their jobs anymore. But even a few years ago, most of most Americans and even most most military officers, most homeland security experts didn't recognize all these people. Fascinating question about who would be in a small room with the President of the United States uh, at, at such a such a key moment. Uh, if you want, we talk about that later on. But it's fascinating. The military officer who was in overall command of the raid on Baghdad that killed Bin Laden was U.S. Navy Admiral. Bill McGraven, who is a distinguished graduate of the Naval Postgraduate School of my institution, so I have to give a little shout out there. Uh, Admiral McGraven has described the raid and the 10 year search for Bin Laden as one of the greatest intelligence operations in history. But he spoke at, at a conference uh, not too long after the raid on Bin Laden, and he said that unfortunately, because so much is classified, Americans are probably not going to know for decades what, what the story is. But what I did in this project, that leads to my talking with you today about it, what I did was, was try to make use of all the information that was released publicly. As you may remember, um, after the raid on Abbottabad, some people criticized the Obama administration for kind of doing a little victory dance, sort of releasing a lot of information. A lot of people were talking to the media, uh, uh, taking credit for things. Uh, I'm not using, you know, there were books and articles by, by folks who you know, said they were part of the Part of the SEAL team, I'm not doing that, I'm not using that. I'm looking at the, the information that was released by the US government to try to see what was the story about the search for Bin Laden. And when I started this project, I assumed that what I would probably find out was that we found Osama Bin Laden by doing the same thing that American intelligence has been doing for decades, that did during my naval intelligence career. <coughs> Sometimes I, I like to refer to American intelligence and the American way of intelligence. So I started out thinking, stepping back here a little bit, I started out thinking that probably we, we won this, this battle to try to find and kill them all. We won that because of the, the same things that helped us win the Cold War. The American way of intelligence, the traditional way that we have done intelligence in this country, established during the Cold War, as you may be familiar, even folks a little too young to, to have lived through that. During the Cold War, we focused on one particular threat. We tended to emphasize operations over analysis. It was the, the doing a little bit less than, than the thinking side of things. And even more important, we won the Cold War largely from an intelligence perspective and from a US military perspective by relying on expensive, high technology systems, what, what has sometimes been called, I like to call it, the mass production mode of intelligence. America during the Cold War, we had more money, more stuff, more gadgets, more people to be able to, to do what we got with it. But we could say we won the Cold War through intelligence using money, manpower, and technology. But very quickly, when I started looking at the case study of the search for the bottom after 9 11, I found that those traditional strengths of the American intelligence community. The ways that we have always done things, uh, at least since World War II, they did not help us find Bin Laden. The traditional methods were not enough. Money, manpower, couldn't find Bin Laden. As I'm sure you remember, after 9-11, really no expense was spared. We, we, the intelligence agencies, national security agencies, um, had, had essentially 
uh, all the capabilities of the U.S. Uh, system available to them. But after we last had a good sense of where the modern was, that famous battle of Tora Bora in December 2001, we weren't able to track it using human intelligence collectors, signals intelligence, uh, everything that we had. We used money, a $25 million bounty. Actually, to me today anyway, $25 million seems a little bit on the, the small side. You know, kind of like, a, you know, what was the, you know, a million dollars? What was the movie with Mini V or whatever, you know? Um, $25 million, I'm not sure that, uh, that I would want to uh, risk uh, crossing Al-Qaeda and like crossing the mob or something like that for $25 million. It, it didn't, didn't lead to, to, to any leads and tips that, that found the mob. We tried using manpower, money and manpower, for buying sources as, as often as traditionally done overseas. The CIA launched in about 2006 what they called Operation Cannonball. This is several years after the attacks, obviously. We weren't making any headway that we could tell on finding bin Laden. Let's flood the zone in Pakistan, Afghanistan, especially the border area between the two countries where most experts figured bin Laden was probably hiding out. And let, let's just go in there big uh, and, and see what we can find. And that sort of brute force approach toward finding bin Laden also didn't work. We used all the technology available. The technology didn't work also. Now, this is the technology that enabled us during the Cold War to do great things, to be able to you know, see inside the Soviet Union, to, uh, to, to listen, to do lots of things. Now, according to press reports, you know, we tried all the typical things that you might expect in order to find uh, bin Laden. Surveillance of journalists, of tapping of, of uh, communications, using software that back in 2001 was very advanced, the state of the art. Now many in this room today may be familiar with tools and such as put out by the company called Palantir. Palantir is a company out in Silicon Valley, out near where I live in California. Uh, but in 2001, around 9-11, wasn't very well known. They were developing new social networking and network analysis tools state-of-the-art, using these sorts of things. Now, Palantir and his products are able to be bought and used by even state and local uh, fusions, intelligence fusion centers and police departments, although it costs a fair amount of money, so it's often the larger agencies able to do it. That did not help us find the model. We used sort of basic, old-fashioned sort of technology, like retouch photos. If anybody remembers, I would see, we, put out playing cards and photos to show what the model might look like if he had shaved his beard and, and wore a suit, those sorts of things. It, it also didn't work. Well, then I, I next assumed that, okay, if the traditional things that American intelligence is good at, and that I spent my early career learning about, if those didn't work, then maybe it must have been the things that we, we did after 9-11, because we reformed our intelligence community, our national security structure, to a great deal, our counterterrorism structure, so that must have been what found in Laden. Setting up new organizations, such as the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, to try to, try to coordinate uh, that, that vast, diffuse American intelligence community. Organizations such as we talked about earlier this morning, like the National Counterterrorism Center, maybe that was what sort of did the trick. That was one of those big lessons from 9-11. We needed to bring all the experts on counterterrorism, that particular problem, together in one room, or one building, one, one large new building. And, Liberty Crossing in near Washington. Maybe that was what helped find Bin Laden. We also, after 9-11, we tried a number of ways to improve the quality and the rigor of intelligence analysis. When I came in the military, when I became a naval intelligence uh, analyst back in 1981, there wasn't really a science to intelligence analysis. There was no tradecraft to it. We were just pretty much taught you know, read a bunch of stuff, uh, be smart, uh, you know, go go brief your boss on, on what's going on, and then do it all over again. Okay, that's kind of what we did. After 9-11, our intelligence agencies and those of our allies, the British, uh, took this to heart as well. We tried to do a better job of understanding what intelligence analysis is. But there's a science to it. It's not just the human intelligence collectors. It's not just the spies that have tradecraft, you know, dropping off notes and you know, call out trees or whatever it is that spies do. Not a spy, I'm an analyst, you know, sort of a difference there. But we tried to develop tradecraft for intelligence analysts too. We also, after 9-11, I'm sure we all remember this, sort of one of those, those bumper stickers from the 9-11 Commission report was that we needed greater use of imagination. 
several, I'm sure most of us, after 9-11. If only somebody had just had in their mind, man, what if, if somebody hijacked a plane not to fly it to Cuba, and kind of lick that problem, or if they hijacked a plane to fly it into something? Now, it turns out that actually many people, many experts had imagined that before 9-11. But nonetheless, that was a, a thinking after 9-11. After we needed to increase, improve our imagination. So maybe that was it. Maybe we had people who just thought of, of smart things and, and that, that succeeded. And use of red teams, thinking like the enemy, all those sorts of things. So I, I wanted to see whether those reforms helped us find a lot. And again, I was disappointed because it doesn't appear that it was the things that we changed after 9-11 to improve our way of doing intelligence. We tried very hard, spent a lot of money, a lot of our, our tax money, going to improve our intelligence and counterterrorism system after 9-11. But those changes don't seem to have been the ones that helped us get a bit of a get in a bit to what really did make the difference. Well, what I found in doing this study is that, for the most part, it was the older, maybe the legacy organizations of the counterterrorism, national security, intelligence, community, those older organizations that had the lead on the search for bin Laden. It was more, for instance, the CIA's Counterterrorism Center, which we read all about in the 9-11 Commission Report, for instance. It was the CIA's CTC that had the lead and had the, the main developments, not the National Counterterrorism Center that was set up specifically after 9-11. Also, those efforts to improve the reliability of our analysis have more rigor to our, our analytical process didn't seem to make the difference either. We tried hard, and we used those sorts of things. You may remember, if you think back, although uh, only a couple of years ago, but it seems like a, a long time ago that we actually caught Bin Laden. But you may remember that when President Obama had been given the final briefings on what the different his different advisors and different agencies thought about who was at Abbottabad, he got a wide range of percentages of different agencies thinking, well, I think there's a 50% chance that it's Bin Laden. No, I think it's a 70% chance. That didn't seem to do any good. And those were mostly, what appears, sort of guesstimates, uh, rather than really scientific estimates anyway. And what about imagination? I really thought I'd find that there must have been a couple of really smart, uh, imaginative analysts who, who led us on the, on the right track, you know, thinking something completely out of the box that would make a great movie or something like that. Um, but that wasn't it either because I found that there was a lot of great imagination. But those imaginative, out-of-the-box uh, ideas that would make a great movie, and some of them have made a movie or two, it wasn't that, those imaginative, out-of-the-box uh, ideas that helped us find the line. And some of those great ideas uh, are just fascinating, uh, such as one of the examples that became public after, after the great on Abbottabad, was when back in the, the first few years after 9-11, back when Al-Qaeda and bin Laden was still releasing uh, videotapes. We still had videotapes back then, so that's one that's hard enough for young people to imagine. Um, we were still releasing videotapes and giving speeches and things. Uh, and uh, folks at the CIA in particular and elsewhere had the smart ideas of let's you know, listen carefully, let's look in the background of these videos, try to see what, you know, what, we, can, what we can learn from them. And one, uh, one thing that was noted in one of the videos was that there was a, a chirping of a bird in the background. And again, this would make a great NCIS uh, episode or something like that. Um, the thinking was, wow, uh, let's find out what bird that is. And maybe we'll get lucky. And that bird will be only found in some you know, small 20-kilometer area of the mountains between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. We'll go there and we'll find it. So they, they got money, manpower. We could pretty much do whatever we could think about it. We got the best ornithologist in the world, who happened to be, to be Germany, uh, to listen to the chirping, and it turned out it was just a common common bird found all over the place. So what a great idea. And when, when we sit down and write our movie about this, we got to put a, a script together, you know, that would work and, you know, be a, be a hero. Maybe the person who thought of that idea would be, you know, the, the lowly lab tech or something like that, you know, uh, in the basement would have the great idea. But it, it was a great idea, it didn't work. Another fascinating idea uh, that was revealed, I believe, by the New York Times, after getting leaks from the administration. And the New York Times didn't even reveal everything they knew about this, this particular effort here. Uh, the idea was somebody had the smart idea, and this was, this was imagination. That, okay, now somebody is actually videotaping Bin Laden, 
uh, and then transferring that tape to somebody else, and then maybe somebody else, and eventually gets it to uh, Al Jazeera or somebody and gets becomes uh, world known. So if we could find some way to trace that taping, maybe we could then find them all. So somebody had the great idea, what an imagination, to flood the area, the bazaars, the markets around Peshawar and other, other communities in Pakistan with late model, high tech, expensive video cameras that had some sort of technology in them. So that if somebody bought one of those video cameras and took it and took a video of bin Laden, somehow, and this we don't know, and that's good, we don't want to know everything, we would have been able to trace this back to where they've been bought, that sort of thing. What a great idea, but as it turned out, this never helped us find the model. For one thing, we stopped doing videotapes uh, as the years, years went on, but also really the only thing that was found was that you could go to a bazaar in Peshawar and other, other communities in Pakistan, and you could find a, a really good late model VCR or videotape recorder for cheap. Uh, and then there just was a run on videotape recorders, but nobody used them to videotape the sound of the model. And during this time, so to the of seven, this was the low point of the search. Time when we really had no idea where it was. Uh, morale within the intelligence community at the, the counterterrorism center at the CIA was getting low. And we learned later that it was during this time that the, the housing complex in Abbottabad was being built and the one was beginning to, to move into it. One of the most important lessons from the search for bin Laden, I think, for the American people to understand, is that this is an example of how intelligence is tough. Finding somebody is tough. Finding a small target anywhere, as I think anybody with law enforcement experience would know this, for Border Patrol, it can be very hard to find one individual, unless you know where to look. If you have the right tools and techniques and technology and you know where to look, you might be able to find somebody or something. But we have a kind of a, a, a rule in uh, a rule of thumb in intelligence, uh, in especially in Navy intelligence. We call it the big ocean, little boat theory. When we're trying to find one ship out in the ocean, it's awfully darn tough, unless you have some sort of a beacon or a tracker or something like that. It's a big ocean out there, and finding one one ship is very difficult. And we've seen that problem, but how difficult it can be to, to find somebody or something a number of times, just in, in our own recent history, you may remember some of these cases, finding the, the Olympic Park bomber uh, in Atlanta, Eric, uh, Eric Rudolph. You know, he hid out. He was able to, to hide for, for a long time until finally being found when he was just forging in a dumpster um, by, by a, a sheriff's deputy, I think it was, essentially by good, luck or good police work, just being out there, being present in the community. Out in the area uh, where I live in California a few years ago, one of the, uh, Steve Fawcett, if you remember that name, it was one of these uh, billionaire adventurers. Uh, and he set out in a small plane to try to fly from California into Nevada, I believe he was going, and his small plane was lost uh, somewhere along the mountainous border between California and Nevada. And despite the largest search and rescue effort that had been ever put on in that area, and despite the effort of uh, his friends and people who knew about this, uh, this man uh, from around the world using Google Maps and using all the technology available couldn't find where he crashed until sometime later a, a hiker came upon some, some of the wreckage from the crash. And more recently, you know, that Malaysian airliner, you know, the 777, 777 the crash was lost somewhere over the Indian Ocean. It seems amazing. It seems amazing to the, the world still today, I think, that we can't know where a late model humongous airplane goes down. Well, we see that, unfortunately, all too often in the intelligence world. It can be very difficult to find somebody or something. <laughs> but what was it that helped us find the lot? Well, the real turn of events was when during this, this time of, of uh, sort of lack of leads and we realized that, that something wasn't working right, that the intelligence officials, primarily at CIA, but throughout the entire intelligence community, realized they were asking the wrong question. The question we were asking so far was, as you'd imagine, where's Bin Laden? That's the question asked of any, any Al-Qaeda operative who was interrogated. That was, that was where uh, the CIA and other organizations were getting lots of leads and tips. Tips you know, Sometimes they were called Elvis sightings. It's like Elvis Presley. You know, many people seem to still see Elvis Presley alive. You know, he's eating a, a peanut butter and, and a pickle sandwich or whatever it, uh, what it is, you know, down at the drive-in or something like that. So a lot of those leads had to be checked out. They weren't leading to anything. 
most of the experts assume, believed, that Bin Laden was probably hiding out in a cave somewhere you know, in that mountainous uh, region between Afghanistan and Pakistan. You know, really rough territory, very, very difficult. But, but where? We just didn't know. And eventually we realized that we needed to ask a different question, uh, looking for the high value target number one. And the realization came to the intelligence community that every time we would pick up a, a senior ranking member of the Al Qaeda organization, it appeared that they were able to get directives from the boss, from Bin Laden somehow. Information was getting out, but it didn't appear that anybody knew where he was, but he was communicating. And so the question that was asked was, how is he communicating? I like to, when I talk to my students at the Naval Postgraduate School, especially those working on a master's thesis or, or a, a term paper, often you want to ask the right question when you start out on a project or a paper. If you don't have the right question, you may not end up uh, producing something that, that you really feel is good about. So the question became, how does he communicate? And as we started looking at that question, as the intelligence community started looking at that question, a couple of other important points came out. And this has been well established in the literature on intelligence studies, when you've seen this in, in movies and things. One was the key role of female analysts. The 9-11 report talks about this before 9-11. There had been at CIA and the Bin Laden unit a number of women who were really, really dedicated to the effort to try to find uh, Bin Laden back in the 90s, before 9 11. And you may think today, women involved in, in the effort, no big deal, obviously. It hasn't always been that obvious. And as recently back as the 90s, as is described in the 9 11 Commission report before 9 11, many of those women analysts at CIA. Uh, didn't have a lot of respect from the rest of the agency. Some of them were even called the Manson family because they seemed to be young women obsessed with this sort of charismatic figure, some Lon Charles Manson. But we saw that also after 9-11, that female analysts played key roles, which hopefully today doesn't even need to be stated. I think as we look at this history, sometimes it does need to be stated. But also, a key role played by all source analysts. This was a search that relied on not just one intelligence discipline, you may be familiar with the INTS, human intelligence, uh, signals intelligence, uh, imagery intelligence, it was all of that that played into how we found Osama bin Laden. And we learned some of that from uh, a, a couple of stories that the Associated Press ran about a CIA analyst who was identified as John, not his real name. John had been uh, leading the team looking for bin Laden after 9-11, and one of the things that he and his analysts, his team, tried to do was read all the open source information they could find about bin Laden. They were finding some potential clues there in this open source, unclassified realm, which still today, many, especially the old timers in the intelligence community, don't think really counts. You know, if it's unclassified, it, it's not really valuable. Unclassified, unclassified information played a big role in the search for the Laden, very positive role. One example was that one of the uh, one of Bin Laden's many sons had written a book, uh, had been quoted in a book, uh, talking about what the advice that dad had given him growing up. And one of the things that his father, Bin Laden, had said was, son, if you're looking to, to keep safe from American airstrikes, <laughs> often the best thing to do is to uh, sort of hide in plain sight. Uh, maybe in a city rather than hide out in some remote areas where it's a little easier for the American Air Force to build a bomb because they don't have to worry about collateral damage. Now that's a little bit unusual sort of fatherly advice to a son, maybe that you know, doesn't happen in most families, but his son wrote about that. And when the CIA analysts led by John read that, they got to thinking, you know, maybe that, maybe we're looking the wrong place. Maybe Maybe he's not hiding out in, in the, the Netherlands and the mountainous region between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Maybe he is sort of hiding in plain sight. But others at the agency, at the CIA, said, what are you talking about? Why are you paying attention to something that one of his sons says? For one thing, he's almost surely lying. And, and for another thing, I mean, what, what does he know? And, and whatever's in the public is always known by the bad guy. So anything that's open source is automatically got to be discounted. Well, but he kept that, that in his mind. It turns out that it was right. As you probably remember, the real turn of the, the search for bin Laden came when we realized, when we learned, 
that Bin Laden had one courier, one primary courier. That's how he com communicated, and that's who we could get to Bin Laden through. But even the search for Bin Laden's courier took a long time. And in fact, the information that led to us understanding that Bin Laden had one courier, and then finally finding him, and through him to Abbottabad, that search started even before the 9 11 attacks. It was, in fact, in August of 2001 when a guy who many experts believe was intended to be the 20th hijacker, Al Khan, uh, arrived at Orlando Airport from overseas uh, and tried to get into the U.S. And the customs inspectors, immigration and officials, uh, checking his information just before 9 11, they didn't think something wasn't quite right. So they sent him back. He was sent away. We learned later, and this is all uh, established in the 9-11 report and other, other sources, we learned later that outside the security area at the Orlando airport, waiting to greet him, you kind of, kind of imagine him standing there with a, with a sign uh, waiting for him, uh, was Mohammed Akhtar, who was later the actual the lead hijacker. So we kicked this guy away, didn't understand what his significance was, but one of the things in the intelligence world that you always want to do is keep information. Keep, keep, you never know when something's going to be useful in the future. Well, then later, at that Battle of Tora Bora, remember I mentioned that was the last time when we feel we had a good sense of where the line was at Tora Bora in eastern Afghanistan, this guy, Al Qatani, was captured. He was later taken to Guantanamo Bay, was interrogated, and he didn't tell us who Bin Laden's courier was. We didn't, we weren't even in that area of, of thinking about it yet. But one of the things that he told his interrogators was that, yeah, one of the, the folks that's close to the boss was this guy named, uh, called the Kuwaiti, Al Kuwaiti, somebody from Kuwait, a, a pseudonym. Uh, and so that, that name went into the databases. And others were asked in interrogations, do you know about this guy? You know, ask all sorts of things. And later, again, this is all unclassified information. A prisoner at one of the, the CIA's uh, secret uh, sites said, yeah, yeah, I know about that uh, Al Kuwaiti guy. And yeah, he's, uh, he's the courier. He transmits the information for Bin Laden. And he's the only one, I believe, that does that. That was both good news and bad news for the intelligence community. It was good news because now we at least had a name, an alias, not a real name, a name. But it was bad news because there was just one name. Instead of now trying to find where Bin Laden was, now we're going to try to find where his courier was. We weren't quite sure whether that was really leading us anywhere, but at least it was it was a lead. You got to have something to go on. And then it was not until 2010, so many years have gone by during this whole process, when signals intelligence, but again, according to press reports, a NSA wiretap of somebody else, they're listening in of somebody else in Pakistan who was in a communication, phone conversation with somebody. And the way that other person was talking made it sound as if that was the current, that was the walk away guy. It would pin down his real name and then watch for him. Later in 2010, officials in Pakistan working for U.S. intelligence spotted this guy who we believed to be the, the courier for uh, bin Laden and began tailing him. Now, even then, in 2010, sort of the betting line was that bin Laden was probably hiding out in that, in that in inter-border uh, region between uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So from Peshawar, he would probably be heading in the center of the, uh, the, the graphic here, probably heading west toward the border area, to the mountains. But instead, he drove east, and he was trailed east to this housing compound in Abbottabad, or hiding in plain sight. And that led to the next phase of the search for the model. And that phase was where we tried to figure out, the intelligence community tried to figure out, is Bin Laden actually in this house, in this compound? And here, too, I think it's important for the American people to understand that our capabilities are limited. You know, when we, we watch television, we watch NCIS, or watch movies, and we all get an idea that the intelligence community, law enforcement, we can do all sorts of things, and we can't. The problem comes up sometimes then when something bad happens, there may be calls for reform or firing people or maybe we need changes and we may not be identifying the right problem. I think it's important we just understand 
the American intelligence, like all intelligence, all national security, homeland security communities, has its limitations. And, and even many of our, our senior leaders often don't understand that. And so that is shown a great demonstration of that, is that it, it turned out to be essentially impossible to identify who was living in this one compound in Abbottabad. But again, we had, we had all the money, manpower, the imagination. We could do whatever we wanted. And again, if this were a movie or a TV show, we'd be able to use some sort of infrared uh, heat-seeking uh, duha. And we'd look inside the house, and we'd, we'd spot them, and then you know, we'd, we'd go and get them. Send some good-looking guys and gals, and we'd capture them, and kill them, or something like that. But it, it couldn't be done. Agents working for American intelligence rented a house right down the road, used all the best listening devices and, and uh, all, the, all the best imagery and telescopes, but, but couldn't figure out what was going on. The folks inside that compound, a number of people clearly living there, were using very good uh, operational security. So they, they weren't using cell phones within the compound. In fact, they were taking the batteries out and they were driving a long way from the compound, not just you know, down the, the road to the quick mark or something like that. They were driving a long way to be able to put their uh, batteries back in the cell phone and, and use, use the phones. We weren't able to listen on anybody there. And we were using all sorts of other capabilities, overhead uh, satellite imagery, even what, what wasn't publicly known at that time was a stealthy drone uh, that was used, and we still weren't able to get good enough imagery of that house and the compound to try to figure out who was living in it. On the graphic here, I've got a picture from the New York Times, later when uh, one of those stealthy drones crashed in Iran, and the Iranians paraded it for the news. And then it became publicly known that we had a, a drone like that. Um, but at the time, we didn't know that we had that uh, publicly. In fact, the intelligence community realized that there was somebody inside that house, inside that compound, who would often go outside and go pacing around, uh, especially the upper floor of the house. But, but he, that person, was protected by a large wall right in the center of the, the, of the house, and we weren't, weren't able to get a good look at it. Something like a, a seven-foot wall or, or something like that, been long, six foot five or so, whatever, um, couldn't get a good shot at it. We would assume, though, that we must be able to look from overhead and try to figure out who he is. But, but here, even our greatest imagery capabilities, according to the press reports, that comes from folks in the U.S. government talking to the press about this, and typically with, with the authorization. You know, most of the leaks in Washington aren't illegal leaks, or they're not, not leaks that are unauthorized. They're, they're government agencies talking to the press. And it turned out that the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, that's our national organization that, that uh, runs our uh, spy satellite systems, the best they could do to determine the height of this pacer, this man who was out walking around the house, was that he was somewhere between 5'8 and 6'8, which didn't do you a whole lot of good in trying to figure out whether this was a 6'4 or 6'5 bad guy. We also had lots of imagination. I love this this part of the story here, uh, and I don't think that that we can blame our intelligence community for a lack of imagination. We've got lots of smart men and women who are thinking of great ideas all the time, and some of these great ideas listed on the slide here were used. Some were just just talked about. None of them helped us find the body. I mean, their ideas sort of fairly basic. You know, throw something in the compound. You know, have everybody uh, run outside and just kind of see who, who comes out. Um, my, my favorite idea, that, at least as far as we know, was never tried, um, was that we, we had a pretty good sense for the genetic markers for the Bin Laden family. You know, large family, so we, we, we knew that we would be able to test based on DNA, if we got DNA evidence from somebody, whether or not they were related to the Bin Laden family. So what we thought is, okay, first thing we thought about, let's try to get a sample of local sewage uh, uh, and it will test, test uh, feces to see for DNA. We might call that poop it. Uh, and I'm not sure who would have gotten the job. I, mean, I don't think anybody did get the job to try to you know, go down there with a little pooper scooper. Um, but but that, that never uh, led us to uh, define good line. But an idea that was tried, and you probably remember hearing about this one, was another effort to, to gain DNA evidence to try to determine whether somebody in that house was related to the Bin Laden family, which would be pretty strong evidence that, that the boss was probably there. And this was the vaccination rules. Whereas 
the CIA hired a Pakistani doctor who had really worked for, for the U.S. Uh, intelligence in the past uh, to set up a what actually was a real hepatitis B vaccination campaign. I mm-hmm. believe they were really doing that with, with local uh, visiting nurses and, and health, uh, health folks. And the idea was that somebody would go up to the house, knock on the door, and say, hi, we're here to uh, help vaccinate everybody. We've got a little bit of a, of a problem with uh, hepatitis anyway, so if you don't mind rolling up your sleeves. And, and the idea was we then get a little bit of, of the blood from, from at least somebody in the house, even if it's not the big guy. Uh, and then we'd be able to figure out if they're related to the lobby. But unfortunately, the folks in the house were, were too operational security concerned. They just turned them away and didn't... Uh, uh, didn't give any uh, evidence out, didn't accept any of the vaccinations. As you may remember hearing after 9-11, uh, that doctor got in a lot of trouble, was sentenced to a, a many decade uh, uh, sentence in prison. You might think that, well, why would one of our allies be mad at one of their citizens for helping us capture and kill um, a, a bad guy that we all wanted to catch? Um, that gets into broader issues of international relations and uh, national security, but it also shows how dangerous sometimes these operations can be, dangerous to people who are involved with them. Finally, in the fall of 2010, our government began the planning for what ultimately became that raid on Obama, led by the Navy SEALs. At that time, the young Canada actually from Monterey, California, where I live now, the Naval Force Graduate School. Uh, Leon Panetta is the CIA director. He briefed senior leaders of the government. Uh, so it was shared, the information on this was shared with the top leaders in Congress. But secrecy was able to be maintained overall. That, that's one of the strong points from this. It's impressive that we were able to keep keep this out of the press and, and out, of, out of sort of general knowledge here. But it became more and more difficult to keep that secret because as the planning went on for several months, a U.S. government was thinking of different options. Should there be an airstrike just to wipe wipe out that that compound? But if we did that, we might not be able to identify who was actually there. We'd never know for sure. Should we send in a SEAL team raid? Should we do something something else? Every time they bring in more people to think about this problem, there was more chance chance of a leak. There were as many as forty different intelligence reviews, red team exercises, bringing in new people who hadn't been involved so far in the search and asking them, all right, look at all this evidence and tell us, do you think it would be Bin Laden in this house? Or could it be some rich uh, Saudi prince or some you know, billionaire uh, uh, playboy with a bunch of wives, and if we end up killing a bunch of innocent folks, that would be a bad thing. Finally, the, the mission was given to the U.S. Special Operations Forces, but it's also interesting, especially for students and those interested in how the federal government works, officially the operation was under civilian, under CIA control, under what's called Title 50 of the U.S. Code, U.S. law, the civilian uh, authorization. Uh, the U.S. military was reporting to the CIA and Leon Panetta, even though they were operationally in charge of U.S. military, special operations. Even at the last minute, there were some serious doubts about whether or not Bin Laden could be there, possibly, and actually, these doubts remind me of, of some that I've looked at elsewhere. Before many other intelligence successes, uh, there are always reasons why maybe we shouldn't do what we're going to do. Here, the question was brought up, could it really be him there? Could it be somebody else? Or could it just be room, a rooms? Is this all fake information that somehow was given to us? And then, just shortly before the actual raid was launched, the information about Abbottabad was almost given away through WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks uh, in the New York Times published information that was put out by WikiLeaks that came from some of the interrogations at Guantanamo Bay. And one of the detainees at Guantanamo Bay had told his interrogators that this place called Abbottabad was really important. He didn't quite know what was going on there, but it was important. That came out in the New York Times. And as some wrote afterward, if Bin Laden had been reading the New York Times, he might have realized that, wait a minute, they, something's going on here. Uh, and, and if they know that my town is important, maybe I better skedaddle and you know, find a Motel 6 for the night or something like that. Luckily, he wasn't reading the New York Times. <laughs> no, this is a, 
a picture of that the house, the compound in Abbottabad, Abad, it was later raised, uh, you know, leveled to the ground, doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's a nice picture. And that area, um, very, uh, it's kind of like the Switzerland of Pakistan. That, that's why many of the uh, the well-to-do and many of the senior senior folks have uh, houses and compounds in that area. But what does all this tell us? Let me wrap up with a couple of, of uh, overall lessons learned and what this tells us for the sort of longer arc of American intelligence and national security. Then open up your questions and see what you all think about this. Well, I think certainly it's a fascinating story. A fascinating story of one of our greatest intelligence successes. And we tend to focus, probably naturally enough, we focus in this country on intelligence failures. Most folks who maybe don't work in the intelligence business, don't aren't studying it necessarily, if you ask them what do they know about American intelligence, they know things like you know, Pearl Harbor, 9-11, or we seem to screw up regularly and, and let bad things happen. Well, this is a success, and that's why I think it's important that, that the American people, that we all, our community, that we understand the goods and bads here, the things that work, the things that, that maybe didn't work. This story certainly tells us about the importance of closer ties between the U.S. military and the intelligence community. Now, I think most Americans would probably think, pretty obviously, our military and intelligence, are they aren't call kind of the, the same thing? Not necessarily. Just like folks in this room, people in different branches of the U.S. military don't always uh, work as closely with other branches as they might be, different uniforms, you know, green, blue, uh, those sorts of things. Folks in the intelligence community don't necessarily and before this effort, didn't necessarily work with the special operations uh, community in the military as much as you might think they should. But one of the things that led to the ultimate success tactically and operationally of the Raid on Ottawa was that our intelligence officials, especially in the, the CIA with the CIA's Counterterrorism Center, and our special operations folks, led by what's called JSOC, the Joint Special Operations uh, Command, they worked very closely together. Another quote from Admiral McRaven, uh, who was the operational commander for the raid on Abbottabad, he said, we couldn't have done the raid on Abbottabad if the CIA and JSOC hadn't been in bed together for years, hadn't been working together regularly for years. In fact, Admiral McRaven also commented at one of the conferences where he spoke about these things after the raid. He said, on that same night that the raid on Abbottabad took place, that was only one of a dozen or so special forces raids that were informed by American intelligence on high value targets throughout that whole region. This, this raid, he said, was just a little more, more dicey, a little more interesting, uh, but it was only one of a dozen or so. But what were the things that didn't work? And I think that's just as important to understand as understanding what were the things that did work. I think it's key that the traditional strengths of American intelligence, the things that won us the Cold War, and that many in American intelligence would, would want to continue stressing, they're not the things that, that in this case were successful in helping us find this one terrorist leader. But I think more is emblematic of how the traditional strengths of American intelligence, money, manpower, technology, they're not always going to help us win the battles against the, the newer threats that we're facing today. We need something different. Also, the, the intelligence reforms after 9-11, they weren't the things that led us to the model. They certainly contributed. It was an all-intelligence community effort. I don't want to denigrate the efforts of, of other agencies and organizations, but still, the new intelligence organizations weren't the ones taking the lead on it. As I mentioned, the National Counterterrorism Center, for instance, set up after 9-11 to be the lead agency for intelligence and counterterrorism it did not have the lead on the hunt for Bin Laden. It was the CIA's legacy counterterrorism center. In fact, the director of the National Counterterrorism Center was only brought into, was branded into the fact that we were looking at a body body, we were thinking of what was going on. He was only brought into that late in, the, late in the game. And maybe that was part of what helped make this happen and, and keep, keep everything quiet, uh, didn't use the new organizations. And using greater imagination wasn't successful. We had lots of great ideas, but it was really kind of old-fashioned, the equivalent of in law enforcement, old-fashioned police work, just sort of old-fashioned intelligence analysis, all sorts of analysis. And I'd say it's 
all sorts of fusion intelligence. Fusion is kind of a term of art that we use often in the military. Now we use it since 9-11 for intelligence fusion centers, such as these state and local intelligence fusion centers. The idea is you bring everybody together, bring in all the sources of intelligence, and try to see what, what sense you can make of it. Ordinarily, you might expect we must always do that. But now in the intelligence community, we have typically been very sort of uh, stratified and separated. Uh, just like in most other communities, different agencies don't talk to each other. But in this case, we needed to bring all the intelligence together. One of our experts, former uh, senior government official Bruce Rydell, had said that the search for bin Laden was really more a story of, of Hercule Poirot as the fictional detective who uses his little gray cells, his mind to, to solve crimes. It's more Hercule Poirot, Poirot, I can't pronounce it very well, than James Bond. Now, I love James Bond. I would have expected it to be sort of a James Bond sort of thing, but no, not so much. It's really that analytical, sort of long, slow, deliberate, took 10 years to do it. It was also really important that we had receptive policymakers. In particular, President Obama, but other leaders of the other agencies. Because that's one of the problems that intelligence often has. That we find that uh, when we bring a piece of information to a senior leader, if they don't understand the intelligence, if they're not inclined to, if they're not sort of simpatico with the intelligence officers who bring it to them, if this is a surprise to them, uh, they may not be well willing to accept it. And I call that intelligence receptivity. In this case, President Obama, I think to his credit, was willing to accept what really was uh, sort of a, maybe a wild-ass guess. It wasn't exactly a wild-ass guess, a, a scientific estimate. 50, 60, 70 percent chance that Bin Laden was in that count. And he was willing to go with that, largely because he was familiar enough with his intelligence leaders, intelligence community, with the sources and methods. Oh, I think it, it's worth pointing out that if it had turned out to be a failure, if it had turned out that Bin Laden wasn't in that compound, if it had been with some rich, uh, rich person uh, with just a, a wide family and we killed a bunch of innocent people, it would have looked bad. And we might be here talking today about an intelligence failure. But it went well, and we're talking about intelligence success. And another part of what was significant and helped for this was operational security. I mentioned a couple of times, we were able to keep this secret. It almost started to come out, but even the White House was able to, to keep a, a lid on that. And we've often thought, I certainly have often thought in the last number of years, ever since 9-11, you know, can we keep a secret in this country? In this time of leaks and WikiLeaks and, and uh, people who want to want to sell secrets or give away secrets, whether for what they perceive to be uh, good reasons or just money. Well, the good news here is yes, we can sometimes keep secrets, and we need to keep secrets. Our government needs to be able to do that. I think, in fact, the success of the search for Bin Laden and understanding what didn't work and what did work shows that we are entering a new period for American intelligence today. I think it's a new way of American intelligence. We're going to continue, I hope, that close relationship between the intelligence community, the IC, and the military. Some people, in fact, argue that we're in a period today that you might call intel wars, where intelligence is more needed than ever. But I think also it shows that we are having a, a reduced reliance on the really big mammoth uh, science experiments, so to speak, uh, that won us much of the Cold War. That we were able to, during the Cold War, establish a, a globe girdling network of satellites and listening posts, billions and billions of dollars to do that. Well, today, as we've just recently seen in, in the private space launch of a, of a large uh, a space rocket, maybe it's private companies that are going to have to be more involved in these things today here. But it also shows that we're going to continue to have a lot of tension. I think it's a healthy tension, but it, it still can be difficult. Tension between the need for secrecy, and what I see is the need for public discussion of intelligence, counterterrorism, national security, and homeland security. Intelligence is often controversial. But as we said before, I think we need to get over our sense in America that, on the one hand, if you work in intelligence, we don't, don't want to talk about it too much, because it's better for us if we don't talk about it. On the other hand, sometimes Americans are concerned and says, well, I'm not sure that I really want to talk about that, or I, I, I don't know much about it. We need to bring it into the open world. Intelligence, I'll just finish up here and then we'll, we'll have a great discussion here. We'll continue to see more and more threats. We talked about some of these during our, our first hour. You, know, you probably heard this that some have described the threats and challenges facing our nation today. They're more like mysteries 
that secrets from mystery is something that nobody necessarily knows the answer to. You know, we're facing challenges like, for instance, how many high school kids in your community are going to get radicalized in the next year. Nobody knows that. The high school kids don't know that. On the national level, we're facing intelligence channel challenges such as what's going to go on in North Korea. Nobody knows. I don't even think the, 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 the one supreme leader in North Korea knows what he's planning to do. What is Iran going to do with his developing nuclear, nuclear program? I don't think they know. So how can we know ahead of time? Some people have called uh, what's going on in American intelligence today a legitimacy paradox. Now, the idea that, that intelligence, to be successful, it needs the support of, of the American people. We need the budget of the American Congress, which needs to be supported by the American people. But in order to be more public, we may sometimes harm our effectiveness. Big data, another issue we can talk about if you like more. I, it seems so frustrating that uh, we're in a world where Google can know what you want to buy. Uh, Amazon has recommendations based on not only your search patterns, but other people who may know you. How can they know what you want to buy, but our American government doesn't necessarily know that somebody was about to become a shooter or a terrorist? Still trying to figure that out. You know, it, took, it took a decade to find Bin Laden. And I don't think that we can afford to take another decade to deal with the challenges that are facing us today. So even though this is a success story, we ended up finding and killing the greatest enemy that our nation faced at that time. We can't afford to take another decade for a future success story like that. So I think that, I'll finish here, I think that, uh, as I mentioned before this morning, I think that one of the, the answers to this, one of the things we need to do is have that better discussion, better public discussion about intelligence. Understand the limitations of American intelligence and the capabilities. Because in order for American intelligence to do its job well, it needs to be supported by the American people. The American people aren't going to support it unless they can really understand and know what's going on. That concludes my presentation. Now I'd love to hear what you have to, to say, what you think about these things. Uh -huh. Great. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, Dr. Bell, thank you very much.